Welcome to Strange Familiars. You're not Allison. No, I am not. Allison's feeling ill tonight, so I have Octavian here to help me with the intro and outro of the show. How are you doing, Octavian? I'm doing pretty good. Let's hope I don't ruin this. Haven't seen you in like 48 whole hours or something. I know. It's a world record. Octavian and I get to hang out a lot. He's my neighbor now. We had dinner two weeks in a row. Mm Mm-hmm. Lovely little sushi restaurant nearby now. Very good restaurant. Yes. I've been quite enjoying it. And great options for uh, those of us who are not eating meat on Fridays. For- mm-hmm. Might go there again. We'll see. This Friday, make it three in a row. We'll see. All right, on tonight's show, I'm going to be talking with Sean, who has these Bigfoot encounters. And then something which sounds like a Bigfoot encounter, but he says in the end he doesn't think it was. This thing was kind of haunting a campsite for several weeks. They were staying there. It was taking things from some of the campers. They were finding them deep in the woods. It was approaching at night. No one could catch this thing. They Everybody went after it. They called the police. The police couldn't find it. He said the one time they did see something, it appeared to be a big guy, which they saw on a silhouette on the hill with a beard, and he may or may not have been wearing a flannel shirt. So I don't think Sean has listened to a ton of Strange Familiars, but that rang some bells for me. I'm sure. Yeah. I like the Bigfoot stories, but I like that story. That was my favorite one of his stories. My new favorite thing is ominous Bigfoot-like creatures on ridges, because if you remember that episode of Sasquatch Chronicles with Les Stroud, he talks about seeing two Bigfoot essentially on the ridge, and they telepathically asked him if they if he wanted to come with them. I would love to get Les Stroud on this show. I know. He has one of the most, I feel, one of the most honest journeys through Bigfoot. If you watch the Survivor Man Bigfoot stuff, he starts out, let's find this creature in the woods. And then over time, he's like, there's something weird about this. There's something Mm -hmm. weird about this. He's, He's very honest about it. And then he ends up, there's some of the stuff that you had to be a member, I think, of his, he had like a member thing on his website. And he had like a members episode he did of of Survivor Man Bigfoot where they got super woo. I mean, they're talking about orbs coming at them and hearing knocks, like answers to knocks when when he got home kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Like all this kind of crazy weird stuff. And he's just arrived at the point where he's like, this isn't a natural animal. And if there was anyone to know what a natural animal is like, it's him. For yeah. Just doing all that Survivor Man stuff originally. Yeah. Lestrade, I know you have Where the Footprints End, Volume 1, because I sent it to you. Come on, Strange Familiars, buddy. Love to talk with you. I'm a big fan. I don't say that about many folks in the Bigfoot world. Mm -hmm. Before we get to Sean, I want to talk about something that's very important to me and hopefully important to Strange Familiars listeners as well. Our on-site shows, many of them, are either directly on or near a through-hiking trail that runs along the Susquehanna River called the Mason-Dixon Trail. York County has done a good job of preserving green spaces. Lancaster Conservancy, you may or may not have heard me talk about them before. I know I talk about them on Discord a lot. I'm not sure if I've ever brought them up on the show. They do great work. They preserve land in Lancaster and York County. They unknowingly give the weird a place to flourish in York County. Well, I mean, you need you need wild spaces for it. Mm-hmm. You need wild spaces for the weird. 
many of the places that we do on-site shows that you've heard us talk about. Devil's Hole, Toad Road, Muddy Creek, the Delta locations where I found the footprint, the state game lands where Chad and I recorded the car door slam. These all fall either on or near the Mason-Dixon Trail. If you like our on-site shows, listen up. There's a proposed facility that they are, want to build at Cuffs Run in York County. It is going to ruin a huge section of the Mason-Dixon Trail if they build this thing. It's going to take out a huge portion of the green space here. You can comment on this. The information is at lancasterconservancy.org slash protect dash cuffs dash run. Cuffs is C-U-F-F-S, like the shirt cuffs. I'm going to read from the Lancaster Conservancy website. In 2023, York Energy Storage LLC proposed construction of a 225-foot-high, 1.8-mile dam and power turbine pumped storage facility, which would flood 580 acres of land along the Susquehanna River, rich with natural, cultural, and recreational resources. By the way, York Energy Storage LLC, not from York. Mm. They just named it that to make it seem like it's a local thing, Mm -hmm. not from York. The facility, which would be located along the river in York County, would use electricity from the grid to fill a reservoir with water from the Susquehanna River when the cost of power is low, then release the water to generate energy during peak power usage periods when the price of energy is highest. This is the fourth time in four decades that some company or another has applied for a preliminary permit to study this very same project. February 10th, 2023, York Energy Storage applied for a preliminary permit for the project from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC, F-E-R-C. September 6, 2023, FERC rejected the permit, citing two deficiencies. November 14th, 2023, York Energy Storage reapplied for a preliminary permit. January 5th, 2024, FERC issued a deficiency letter. January 15th, 2024, York Energy Storage resubmitted to FERC. February 1st, 2024, FERC accepted the preliminary permit application and provided public notice of it. We are now in a 60-day window to file comments and interventions objecting to the project. Comments and interventions can be filed through March 31st, 2024. Is there any kind of uh, like town hall for local people to speak up about this? It's a federal project. We have to comment. Our way to speak up is to comment on their website. Continuing with Lancaster Conservancy, why we are opposed, the Lancaster Conservancy, along with multiple government, nonprofit, and community partners, including Susquehanna National Heritage Area, Lower Susquehanna Riverkeeper Association, Farm and Natural Lands Trust of York County, and Cuffs Run Alliance, is opposed to this proposed pump storage facility. Among other reasons, the project would destroy preserved farms, a section of regional scenic Mason-Dixon Trail in York County, the view shed from the popular multimodal Anola Low Grade Trail in Lancaster County, so it's going to affect the other side of the river as well. Forested lands much needed to help ensure the ecological health of the Susquehanna River lands landscape and waterway. The landscape of the Lower Susquehanna River Gorge has been recognized by both state and federal governments as worthy of protection and investment. The state of Pennsylvania prioritized this area for protection as a conservation landscape in 2010 and the federal government designated the region a national heritage area in 2019. In the last 10 years, over $100 million has been invested by county, state, and federal governments, as well as nonprofit partners and local municipalities along the river. These investments have supported a thriving and growing outdoor recreation and tourism economy, which would be threatened should yet another power generation facility be added on this stretch of the river. We should stop here and note, there's already a dam right there. Right across from it. There's a dam further down the river in Maryland. There's the nuclear plant in Delta, the Peach Bottom Power Plant. We do not need another power plant in yeah. this area. We just don't need it. Back to Lancaster Conservancy. While sustainable, renewable energy options are needed to protect our environment, this project is not green. Facilities like this one pump water into a reservoir, then release it to generate electricity when demand and the price of energy are high. According to York Energy Storage's permit application, the efficiency of the project is expected to be 80%. This means that it takes about 20% more energy to pump the water into the reservoir than is generated when that water is released. Proposed facility at Cuffs Run would involve the destruction of carbon-storing biodiverse forests, and it, it would use energy from a grid mostly powered by natural gas and coal to power the pumps that would fill the reservoir. 
About 60% of the energy generated by the PGM grid, which includes Pennsylvania and Maryland, along with all or part of 11 other states and Washington, D.C., comes from natural gas and coal. What you can do. File interventions or comments with the FERC. The Conservancy is actively organizing opposition with our partners and preparing to legally intervene with FERC to formally object to the project. You can also intervene or file comments to let FERC know we don't want this facility on our lower Susquehanna River. In general, individuals who are not landowners within the project boundaries might be best served by using their time to submit comments. Intervention makes you an actual legal party to the case, while filing comments alone makes you a commenter, but not an actual legal party. Either way, FERC must consider your comments and objections in deciding this important case, and FERC will consider those comments whether or not you also intervene. They have how-to options on their website. I'm going to put links in the show notes. If you live locally, if you live near, if you plan on ever coming to visit this area, you've heard me talk about how beautiful the hiking is along the river. Please comment. It does take about 15 to 20 minutes to do because you have to fill out the forms. I know time is valuable to everyone. If you care, please do. This isn't a political issue. I keep politics out of strange familiars. This is an issue about preserving this green space, preserving this area for future generations, for people who love it, for hikers, for hunters, for fishermen, for you and for me. Please, if you have the time, please comment. Again, especially if you're local, I think it'll mean a lot. I have wanted to do for a while a sort of what do they call it? a sort of telethon? I don't know, radiothon, potathon? Mm-hmm. Not for us, for things that we find causes that we find you know worthy of support. So I did want to mention this. Uh, it's very important to me. The Mason Dixon Trail is where I spend most of my hiking time. I love it. Chad calls me a river rat. I've converted him a little bit. At first, he was like always wanted to go to the mountains. Now, often he's like, Let, let's head to the river. Mm-hmm. I showed him the beauty of the river. You've I know. I'll be spending a lot of time down there as well. You've seen the gorge. Oh, yeah. Here. Yeah, you know how beautiful it is. Mm-hmm. It's stunning. That's many parts of the Mason-Dixon Trail, and they've rerouted some of it to just the nature of the trail as it, as it follows the Susquehanna South. Sometimes you have to get off the trail and get onto roads to hike for a little while. But some of it they've rerouted. Some of it that used to be on roads, they've now rerouted through these parks, many of which Lancaster Conservancy was responsible for building and and for making into parks or Mm -hmm. for purchasing the the land and keeping it green space. So again, if you can comment on that Cuffs Run thing, if you want to support Lancaster Conservancy, I'm sure they could use the financial support as well. LancasterConservancy.org. I'll put links to the show notes for that and for the, uh, the Cuffs Run thing, how to comment and so forth. So as we're doing our little mini potathon here, I asked you, do you have anything that is you know, meaningful to you, uh, an organization that you would like to promote, Mr. Octavian. Yes. Okay, so the charity that I wanted to support and bring attention to was the WCS, which is the Wildlife Conservancy Society, and they conserve habitat for 50% of Earth's biodiversity. Um, they've protected 350-plus areas of wildlife and green spaces and they give back to indigenous communities all over the world and work to repopulate endangered species of animals and things like that and I am a wildlife lover and animal lover I work at a a vet hospital so it's a vested interest in mine as well and they have a donation of you can donate as small as five dollars to a hundred dollars on their website Tim will probably put that in the show notes as well I will indeed so, yeah, that's my charity of the week. They are WCS.org. That's easy. Mm-hmm. WCS.org for them. So And the donation page is on the front page at the very bottom. So Awesome. Now that we've done our good deeds, let's go ahead and hear my talk with Sean. All right. I'd like to welcome Sean to the show. How are you doing tonight, Sean? Good, good. How are you? I'm good. So 
you contacted me after some people recommended Strange Familiars to you, and you said you might have some stories I'd be interested in. You said the magic word Bigfoot, so I guess let's start with, with your Bigfoot experience, or is it more than one? Well, I'm 45 now, but when I was 8 years old, my sister, she was uh, 14 then, she had a picture, and the picture was, there's a chain of islands on Lake Superior just north of Wisconsin. There's like, I don't know how many islands there are, but back in like the 80s, that's where she was with her friend. Her friend's parents had like a boat, and she spent a lot of time with them, so they would go all over on the boat, but she had this picture of her. She was sitting on this giant, like, looked like the size of like a one-car garage. It was a boulder. And her friend was probably standing far enough away to catch the picture of her and the boulder. So she was probably a good distance. I'd say maybe, I don't even know. I couldn't guess. But off to the left, her right, on the ground, you can see, I always thought to myself when I asked my sister too, I was like, why is there a monkey in the picture? She's like, what do you mean? I said, look. And ever since then, I always wondered, why Why is there a monkey <laughs> in the picture? Yeah. And we couldn't figure it out. And we just kind of chalked it up as like whatever. So, And then it just went back in the box and went back into storage. And then when I was like uh, uh, probably 17, we dug the box back out and we were looking through the pictures and everything. And she pulled that picture out and she's like, look, she's like, look, remember the monkey? And I'm like, yeah. How is there a monkey right there in the picture? Like this is Minnesota, Lake Superior on an Island, you know? So I'm like, this is just makes no sense. Like, and I, I didn't know anything about Bigfoot. So I was like, this makes no freaking sense. So, and then like web TV came around and uh, I don't know if you remember web TV, but you could hook it up to your TV and yeah, the internet. Yeah. But we got that, and then that's when I learned about Bigfoot. I sent my picture to a couple like researchers, and they told me it was just a uprooted tree, mm-hmm. which was bullshit. I don't know. But then some couple people, uh, one guy out there, he drew me a picture and said what he got in on it. I said, well, if, if you could get that from whatever you're clearing up and zooming in, you got software, you know, software, you know, send me the real picture. And he was just weird, but he only sent me what he drew and he was a really good drawer, but um, that was kind of scary to see. But I was just wondered why there's a monkey. I got involved in like uh, in 97, I started getting money annuity money because my dad was killed when I was two. So, in 1980 so like there was a bunch of money left behind because i was the youngest i got the most and growing up you know my sister's always telling me like you know when you turn 18 you're gonna be rich and i'm like yeah what i don't even i didn't even care i didn't even know like anything and then when i turned 18 yeah i got that first check and i was like like i don't i don't need to work so (laughs) i just i delved more into bigfoot and i always thought to myself like if I would have picked a different path back then when I turned 18, I'd probably be married with, you know, kids and I'd still be in Minnesota. I wouldn't be in Oregon like I'm now and single, but I chose that. I like really delved into Bigfoot. It was weird. Hmm. I spent a lot of time, you know, I was more pro kill and all the research teams in Minnesota really didn't like me too much. So I kind of stayed under the radar. You know, I was always like, not really in the know. I was kind of more snooping because I was, you know, really amateur, just kind of doing my own thing, kind of going a different route because they were all just about going out and doing wood knockings and screaming. And I think that's just dumb. But the way I did it was I was trying to bring them towards me. So it was a lot of like trying to figure out where like clusters are based off other people's sightings. So I'm like snooping all these, you know, research team websites on web TV and I'm finding all these like hot spots. and some of them that, you know, have more than others, you know, I just, but I'd go to these areas and I would try to pull it towards me. And then if I get a clear shot, I didn't care if it was male, female, you know, child, whatever. 
I was more pro kill because I feel, you know, like it should be proved. And, you know, I kind of want to prove it too. Not really much anymore because I'm not rich anymore, but now I'm here in Oregon. I don't even really go out and look for it here. I know it's here. That's the thing about here in Minnesota is that's why I was so hush-hush about it and only told so little people was because of Minnesota. You talk about Bigfoot, you know, they look at you like you have three heads. Here, you ask everybody, anybody, have you seen Bigfoot? And people, they've seen some weird shit down here. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's a Bigfoot sticker on everybody's car. <laughs> yeah. Bigfoot's having a pop culture moment, too, I think, because I've noticed that. Like in the time, even since I started writing about it and stuff, it's I see a lot more Bigfoot stickers and T-shirts and everything now. I mean, hell, I got one in my car now. I had one until it peeled off. So I just went a different route and tried to lure them to me. What I noticed was it was really hard pulling anything older than like a juvenile, a child. Like that's the only action I would get. They wouldn't come close. They would never come out of the tree line, but... They would come close. Like, you're thinking, like, there is a chance, but then it was very amateur. I didn't know what I was doing out there. Did you ever pop a shot off at one? No. Because mm-hmm. I never had a clear shot. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know, you know. People always say, like, if you shoot one, they're all going to come kill you. I don't believe that. I really don't. I don't, I don't think that they're going to do that. I think they're just going to scatter. They're going to run, be scared, less. So how did you draw them to you? First, I started with, like, noises, like toys and, like, loud things that babies like. I didn't know any way to attract something that lived out, you know, something that they never see before. Mm -hmm. So, like, something loud and kind of babyish because I didn't know what kind of... Sure, yeah. Kind of like, you know what I mean? Like, I was bringing, like, foreign foods out there. Mm Mm-hmm. Because at the same time, I, my cover was I was coyote hunting if the state ever came or DNR or anybody. Right, yeah. And then I was in certain areas more than others. So, And it was amazing how close they were to the city. I have found, at least here, that some of the places we get activity is oddly close to houses and civilization. Yeah, in Minnesota, there's it's, it's called Lionel Lakes. It's like... The chain of lakes, because, you know, Minnesota has 10,000 lakes, so there's a chain of lakes that kind of go into maybe like 30 minutes north of Minneapolis, and they're they're there. There's a wildlife management area where there's a lot of areas that are shut off and closed off where you can't hunt, so, you know, because management area, so they have a lot of places they can hide there. That's where I was going a lot. It's called Carlos Avery. Wildlife management area. It's really big, really big. But a lot of areas were like off limits. So, mm-hmm. did you ever get a, a really good look at one? Yeah, like I seen a really small baby, and then I saw like what I say baby is like maybe I don't know. It was small. It was like five. Looked like a five year old. And then I seen like a bigger one, but I didn't know what I was gonna do if I lured a child out. I mean. I didn't really, at that time, I don't think I really cared too much. I just I had some people that I was in, a, I'd contact in the Bigfoot world that I feel I could trust, but, you know, I was just really low key and in the radar kind of, but now I see these, I still kind of follow some of the, I don't follow them, but the Minnesota Bigfoot guys. And I'm like, you guys are, I don't know. I don't know what happened to them. They just kind of sold out. They fell out. Because they're doing, like, tours and, like, bringing people out and hitting, like, bats. And there's another guy that's, like, doing that samurai talking into, like, a loudspeaker. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just, like, what are you doing? I don't understand that. Because at first, he was really, like, into Bigfoot. But he kind of, like, sold out, so. I mean, you know, there's people who say that works for him. When we go out, we don't do, tend to do a lot of hollering and knocking and stuff. We just kind of go out and be in the woods, you know? Yeah, let them come to you. I suppose so, yeah, yeah. So can you describe them, like, what you saw? Uh, yeah, it's weird. I don't know. They just, they look more doggish when they're young. Or at least these did. I don't believe the, the dog man thing. I just feel like maybe that's a different, like, breed of Bigfoot, but... Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I, I find the sudden prominence of Dogman reports a little suspicious. It's like they just came out of nowhere. Well, in fact, I know some researchers are, are turning Bigfoot reports into Dogman reports because Dogman's the, you know, he's the big, scary new guy. I printed a story in one of my books that another researcher had down as a Dogman story, and the witness contacted me and said, I, I never said it was a Dogman. Like, what are you doing? And I was like, well, I'm just printing what the other researcher said. I didn't, you know, it's kind of reprint what he said. So I know, in fact, some researchers are, are changing Bigfoot reports to Dogman reports. So when you say it looked dog-like, and I, I mean, like, what about it? Like a puppy, you know, like could not. It looked dog-like in the face or just in its manner? Was it on all fours? Like, what about it was dog-like? You know, like how it looked and kind of how, like how it moved. It was a quadrupedal or was it on two legs? It was just weird. It was like a baby. It was like just sitting there like, you know, like a baby would on the, sitting on its butt, just kind of moving. Like, it really wanting to move. Like, I don't know. It's just really weird. Like, I felt like for some, sometimes that I was really close enough to him that maybe the family wasn't that far away because mm -hmm. maybe they do hang out in the thickest part of the woods. I don't know. But I always seemed like I was always near a tree line, which was really thick. Mm -hmm. And that, that was the thing was trying to pull them out of their comfort zone, but they would never leave. They'd come close, but they wouldn't come out. I know that guy, that bear hunter in California who said he shot, I think he shot, what he said, a mother and a child or two childs. I don't know. But he, he described the young one as looking like kind of like a dog in, in the face. With that Justin guy? Yeah. Yeah. Which, yeah. Yeah. I don't yeah, know. I, if heard, I, his, I yeah, heard his story. Too. Yeah. I don't know if I believe his story or not, but I'm just saying that he did describe it like that. Yeah. He said he shot the mom and then, and then he shot the shot the kid. I'm like, what? Would... It's hard to say with this stuff. And the thing is, yeah. like, you know, in doing research on the bodies that people have claimed to have, 100% of these things, not even 98%, not 99%, 100% of these things that people have claimed to kill have disappeared in one way or another. You know, we do not have a body, and there's been, you know, I don't know, in my book, I tracked down at least 10 different examples of people who claim to kill them, and not one body's out there, including the Minnesota Iceman. If that was ever real, that body's gone. You know, that's been replaced with, supposedly, the real one was replaced with a model. So if that was ever real, that's gone. So it's interesting to me, just like, I don't know, there's something weird about these things. The fact that even when people supposedly get them, they disappear. Yeah. I did it from like 97 to like 2008. And then I stopped and now I just listen to stories and it really wasn't that exciting. It was, I mean, it was exciting for me because I was out there hunting it and I was trying to pull it out. And there's just a lot of time spent out there and a lot of... A lot of hours and a lot of just like not knowing what I'm doing, but just doing it anyways. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what did the, the larger one that you saw look like? Um, I had never seen the larger one. Oh, okay. I've only seen like juvenile to the child. Oh, okay. So the one that was larger than the, the infant or so, you, didn't you say you saw two? Yeah, I didn't really see his face though, but he was just big and looked like a linebacker. and But he was just small, like a smaller linebacker and... It was crazy. But you could tell that they wanted to come out, but they just, they wouldn't. Covered in hair, like the typical kind of. There was a guy, He's I, he disappeared off YouTube, but he was another guy in Minnesota that was, he was a researcher, but he had a video where it was like, literally, it had to have been at his feet. Like, just the way that he was positioned the camera, it was as low as it could possibly go, but you could clearly see its face in his hand and it was like picking up it slowly picked up like the log in front of it kind of off to its right and slowly pulled it to cover its face and i'm like that was weird and then that video kind of disappeared after a while but then i asked him about it and then then he disappeared i was like man i don't know what's going on but i was following a lot of like people just kind of in the background like areas that they were getting good, you know, good sightings, good, good everything, getting gifted. I would just go there and try and get me one. Mm -hmm. What kind of weapon do you use when you go out hunting for Bigfoot? Well, I always thought it really didn't matter. It just was shot placement because most people are, they just shoot where they shoot because they're frightened, I guess. You just shoot to shoot. But I would think something that big, you'd have to shoot it like in the eye or the nose, the head. The ear, somewhere soft where it's going to go in and, you know, headshot. 
Mm-hmm. I don't know because people say that it has a different the hearts over here and like, yeah, I've heard the stuff like that, like the, like the hearts in the yeah. armpit and stuff. And I'm like, how do you? I'm like, I really would like to interview <laughs> yeah. these people and ask them how they know. Where's yeah, exactly. what, what are they basing this on? Yeah, yeah, that's that's why. But I figure something that big is gonna have some pretty strong bones. So certainly, yeah, I would shoot somewhere where it was soft tissue and something that they need, like their eyes. Mm-hmm. I'm still for it, but I don't really do it anymore. I don't know why. I mean, I'm here. Perfect. Perfect out here in, in Oregon. They'd probably just kill me and eat me. <laughs> well, I mean, there's I come from the, the weirder side of things. And, you know, I've taken a number of, well, I didn't take a number. I've read a number of reports. I've researched a number of reports of people shooting them to no effect whatsoever. That'd be the only thing I would worry about. That and, and uh, like those fellas down there in, in the south, I'm really worried they're going to, the uh, pro kill guys down there, I'm, I'm worried they're going to take out a hunter by mistake. That's the only thing I worry about that. They're using like uh, heat vision scopes and stuff. And I'm just, man, if you, some, I know they have a secret area, but if some hunter wanders into their area by mistake, and I'm just worried about that. I hope that they're careful with whatever they're doing. That's all. I know. They got all the, the thermal and the night vision. They got the perimeter freaking sensors. And mm-hmm. yeah, they're nuts. But it's also crazy how quiet they are. The Bigfoot. Yeah, yeah. They yeah. move like the wind. Oh, if that's what snuck up on us a couple times in these areas. Yeah, uh, it's, that's what's it's scary. Like, yeah, that's... they're there. They're not there, and then they're there. That's the only thing I can say. And they growled at us, or one growled at us, or huffed at us, or something, and either moved so quick that by the time I got my headlamp on and panned it around, it was... 15, 20 yards away, or it was another one 15, 20 yards away because I hit sides with the light and it lit up, but impossibly close to us in the brush. And I was like, how, like, we did not hear that approach at all. Yeah, I had one with my, it was my, my friend's dad, the mom, and then the one, two, three, there's like five of the kids there. We all, they all went camping for a month because they bought a house. I don't, I'm not going to say it's Bigfoot, but whatever it was, it was really good at what it did. Whatever it was, was quiet, like a ghost, but could stand right in front of you. and You didn't even know it. And it was just weird. I, me and my friend seen it, the silhouette of it sitting on top of the hill, which I think it kind of probably wanted us to see him. Because mm-hmm. then the reason I don't say it was a Bigfoot was because the, from the silhouette, from what me and my friend seen it looked like a dude with a trucker hat on and a, like a goatee beard, but kind of like pointy on his chin. And he had like a, probably like a flannel on, but you couldn't see the flannel, but it just, it looked like a bulky, like button up shirt. And he was just chilling on the, on the hill and the moon was kind of bright. You could see like through the trees and then you could see. And then as soon as me and my friend got up to run at him, all he did was laid forward he was gone but we didn't know if he just laid down or if he really took off because if he did we wouldn't know because this happened before and we were just thinking either he has really good night vision or i don't know but yeah that was just that was really weird too yeah that is because it got it got like so bad that the local police came and then they sent in a state trooper the state trooper helicopter came in and flew over and did the thermal and night vision. And what they said was weird was that there's nothing in the park from like around us for ever. Like, hmm. like no deer or anything like nothing. Yeah. No deer, nothing. Mm-hmm. And they chopped it off as the whistling was like a bird somewhere. You were hearing whistling along with whatever else was going on. Yeah, that was, it went on for like three weeks. It was pretty crazy. That's wild. But that's what I mean. It was so quiet because his dad ran in the woods. I ran in the woods. Three of the brothers, we all ran in the woods. And we were all probably literally like five feet from each other in the pitch dark. We couldn't see anything because neither of us had flashlights or, you know, we didn't, I don't think we had, you know, we didn't have cell phones back then. So, you know, we we're camping like, mm-hmm. and they had like a camper and, we had a tent. Yeah, so we're like probably literally like five feet from each other. All these dudes just kind of with their arms we're, with their arms out too. So we're kind of like 
feeling around because we can hear we can hear them we can and the, the dad was like you know telling us to all to shut up and he's like whatever it is it's standing right in front of me so find me now and we we're like trying to frantically like go towards his voice and then yeah i don't know got away wow so weird yeah i don't that's why I was, you, you couldn't hear it run you could just hear it breathe kind of and then it would you know whistle and yeah it was weird so other than just kind of creeping around and whistling what was it doing around the camp for that long well when we first heard it you heard it come down the hill and but you you know obviously you could tell it was on you know two legs and then it would like come at the bottom of the hill and it was kind of foresty it was kind of there's a good tree there's a good tree cover there's then there's a hill but then on the top of the hill there was kind of like a bike path so we thought it was maybe somebody but they would stop at the bottom of the hill and then the weirdest thing that i thought was me and my friend were sitting on the picnic table and like five raccoon came out of the tree line they didn't look scared but they looked like they're in a hurry and then the tree kind of shook and you, you kind of heard like a growling but it was super high it was probably like nine feet up but for some reason my brain didn't i don't know i just didn't put two and two together and i kind of chopped off as like it was a dog but i don't know it was really weird because i asked my friend i was like because he's seen what i seen i don't know if he heard what i heard but he's seen the tree shake and we were probably literally like four feet from that tree so it kind of spooked us with the raccoons coming out I kind of like looked at my friend and I said, does, you know, do raccoons normally do that? Four or five of them just come charging out of the forest. <laughs> I didn't think of it as like Bigfoot because it, because our tent was literally in the tree line, like four feet. So our heads, when we were in the tent, our heads were in the trees, in the woods. Mm-hmm. And we never had any issues. Like we had a big window right there. and You know, we never had like any, anything like mess with us, like next to the tent or like anything like that. Whatever it was started messing with some of the other campers that were next to us. Just, you know, stuff was missing and then they'd find it in the woods. Hmm. I don't know what that was. Cause I, I look up like that city was Lake Elmo in Minnesota and it's probably maybe 45 minutes uh, east of Minneapolis, maybe Maybe an hour. I don't think an hour. Probably 45 minutes. It's closer to St. Paul. I still always wondered because me and my friends, we all, you know, we still talk about that. Like, what was that at that park? Like, it's just weird. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know how much you've listened to the show, but when you say somebody in in the flannel shirt. I don't think it was a flannel shirt. It was just a big, bulky, like, button-up shirt. Like, you could really see the collar and you could see, like, his trucker hat, you could see his beard, and mm-hmm. it was the weirdest thing. Yeah. I asked my friend, I was like, you see what I see? And he's like, yeah. He's like, why is this f- sitting on top of the hill? Like, nothing. Like, he's like, no big deal. So we figured it was him. Because mm-hmm. the one cop, when he went in there, he had his canine. He went in, he walked in the forest, like, maybe 10, 20 feet, and then he stopped, turned his light off. You heard whistling to probably his, I think his... I think it was his south, and then he, you hear it like in front of him after like 10 seconds, and he turned his flashlight on kind of frantically, like looked behind him, and then turned his flashlight off again, and then you heard the response whistle, and then he turned it on again, and then you looked at his dog, and his dog kind of was like, eh, and then he called in that chopper. Interesting. That state trooper. Wow, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. And then that chopper was like there's nothing there's nobody hmm. yeah i don't know but that sounds like some of the stuff we've had kind of approach us it's like like you said they're like a ghost or something they're just they're not there and then they're there and it's very disconcerting yeah because you could really tell it was it was somebody because they would come it would happen for like two three weeks and it would usually start around the same time like come down the hill walk around a little bit you know for a while like i think the he didn't take any of our stuff, but like the other family, like we found towels, like really deep in the woods, hanging on trees, like 
like somebody hung it up there, you know, kind of yeah, yeah. sprawled it out. There was like a weird moment with when me and my one of the brothers and me, we were uh, walking down this path and we heard like splashing probably 30 yards, 40 yards away. And I just kind of jokingly yelled out, help me. And there was kind of like a really faint, scary response. My friend's like, we got to go check. I'm like, if we go check, I don't think we're going to make, we're going to come back. He's probably going to murder us. Was it like a grunt or a growl? Like the response? No, it was, the response was a super creepy, help me back. Oh, that's creepy. Wow. Yeah. So I was like, help me. And then you heard like, help me. Oh, geez. Yeah. I was like, wow. And my friend looked at me like, you heard that, right? I'm like, yeah. I was wow. like, that's somebody, somebody f***ing with us because there's no, no, that was weird. Yeah, that's creepy. Wow. But that was before all the weird stuff, like, started happening because, like, my friend, the bro- they're all brothers and then they had one sister and they were at the lake. There's, like, a man-made lake where you could, you know, had, like, fresh water, like, it was clean. But all the brothers were, were like, swimming and the one brother said they looked back onto the beach and they saw the sister standing there watching them swim. And there was some dude like standing behind her, like no, his nose to like the back of her head, like it's that close, like just kind of creeping. Like, I don't know. I don't know what that was about. They kind of chucked that up as to maybe having to do, because they said after that weird incident, like everything started happening. I'm like, mm. it's like whoever this is, is has like clouds for feet. And they can move super fast because w- when we were walking through there, it was really out. We were like elephants. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Like you knew we were back there and, and that's, that's why it was, it was just mind boggling. Yeah. At night you can hear all kinds of critters, natural critters, whatever. They make noise, little things. Mm-hmm. And you could kill yourself trying to walk in the dark. Oh, so absolutely. I don't know how he was doing it. <laughs> yeah. I can't without a headlamp. Chad's got my my investigation buddy. He's got better night vision than me. But I can, with without a headlamp, I'm I'm tripping all over the place. I don't have good night vision. Yeah, but I mean, like this was back in like I don't know. I mean, not that far, but maybe like 2000, like 2000. So it was it was weird. Yeah, yeah. Would it be every night for like three weeks? Two or three weeks, yeah. And then it kind of stopped after the it got to the point where the law enforcement had to step in and hmm. they said the whistling was a, a cat in the tree. Okay. But the area that they told us it was in didn't make any sense because we knew it was, it was far, but it was close enough that it was closer than it was far, but it it was just weird how it sounded. It sounded far, but you knew it wasn't. Mm-hmm. And that uh, that whole thing was weird because one of the brothers went into the army and did his all you know his his thing so he was kind of a crazy one running through the woods trying to find this whatever it is because they were all saying like oh it's that whatever that thing you believe in that bigfoot you're you know, they're like you you hunted it so much now it's hunting you I'm like, <laughs> I'm like no it's that's it's I said it's not it's not a bigfoot it's no. I didn't get that feeling. That's why I just felt like it was somebody. Mm-hmm. And even the, the dad, he was, you know, ex-military too. So he was like, yeah, he's like, they have to have night vision or something because they're just too, too good. Like there's no, no getting past it. Cause I know that they make stuff that you can put on your feet for hunters. Cause you know, I'm a hunter, so I never used them before, but I know they make those things for your feet so you can somewhat move a little quieter you know, there's like a bigger, a print, a bigger print, so you break less. Mm-hmm. But I mean, even out there, like, it was just, I don't know if you've been to Minnesota, I don't think the upper Midwest is any, because where are you from? Pennsylvania. Yeah, I don't really know Pennsylvania is, I've never been out there, so I don't know, like, what the, if it's anything like Minnesota where, you know, like the forest, like. Because the forests here in Oregon are nothing like they are in Minnesota. So. Yeah, out Pacific Northwest, it's just a different kind of thing. Uh, did, like deciduous forests in Pennsylvania. You know, if you get up high enough, you get some pine forests and stuff. But most of it's deciduous forests. A lot of hills, a lot of rocks. A lot, a lot of rocks. 
you know, a lot of leaves, a lot of twigs and mm-hmm. dead fallen wood. And yeah, you know, like yeah. you're, you're not gonna, if you just casually walk through the woods, people are going to know. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. You, even a squirrel going through the, the woods sounds like sometimes sounds like a, a 300 pound human. Oh yeah. I'll be hiking alone and I'll hear like crunch, crunch, crunch. I'll look over. It's just a little squirrel. You know, it's just like things make noise here. There's too much litter on the ground. Yeah. And that's how it was in, in, you know, back then. And, you know, it was like, you know, peak summertime. So it was hot as shit. That's what the law enforcement said, though, was that they were more just, how is it nothing? Like, how is there nothing? Yeah. Because the cop said that he swears and how his dog reacted that there's something there close and there's two of them. How can it, because that chopper made like three, four passes and he went the whole park and he wasn't really far. Like it was weird. Like he was that close when he called it in. Cause I don't know if they were coming already or if they were just that close because as soon as he called it in, it was like literally two minutes. You could hear the, you could hear the chopper coming. I'm oh, like, wow, nice. that was, that's, I was like, I, I was like, that was really fast. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, do you guys know something already? Cause other campers were complaining, calling law enforcement and, Seeing, you know, stuff's missing, you know, like they're getting weird things happen to them. And like, so it wasn't just us Mm -hmm. and it wasn't just us on that side of the park. It was happening on like another side of the park, which was weird, but I don't know what that was about. Hmm. I forgot to say too, is they had a a dog and for some reason, I don't know what the, the headache was about, but they had to like put the dog in a different area of the park. So one of the brothers had to go and put a tent over at this little lot where you're allowed to have the dog for a certain amount of time. And then I went and hung out with him for, I think two days. And one night I heard, it sounded like, I don't know, maybe five, 10 horses like running on really like hard, solid ground. But there's no horses anywhere around. It spooked the dog so much that when the dog like hit the front of the tent, the zipper just like went, zzz, it went up and the dog was gone hmm. and the dog never came back. Oh, I don't wow. Know, it's, never found it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Wow. The dog never came back. Wow. My friend didn't wake up. He was sleeping. He doesn't believe me. He was like, that was our family dog. Like, why would it just like, I don't know. It's like sounded like there's a gang of horses outside running around us, but then it stopped. Kind of scared me a little bit because I knew that there was no horses or anything loud enough like that to be running, enough to scare the dog. And then the dog takes off, and so where'd the dog go? I don't know. Wow. But that was in a complete different area. There was no trees anywhere. It was just all open field. There's really no trees. So he didn't wake up or or you, you could not wake him up when this happened no he didn't he didn't wake up mm-hmm. you think it was just he was just slept through it it wasn't anything weird about not being able to wake him up yeah i don't you know okay. i think he could probably sleep through like atomic bomb but... okay all right yeah because sometimes we have these reports where where stuff happens and people can't wake somebody up i mean there was the one what's uh the uh, monster quest guys up at snow grove lake they said that something came around and was like banging on the cabin and, and stuff. And the one guy was awake and he couldn't wake anybody else up. He said he was pounding on them, shaking them. Nobody else could wake up. Oh yeah. No, nothing like that, man. That's disturbing though. Just, and the, just no sign of the dog from that point on. Yeah. Wow. That was the weird thing. And it was a busy campground too. It was really busy. There's a lot of, a lot of RVs, a lot of primitive camping, a lot of, there's that man-made lake. There's like other attractions. So it was just always hopping. And I was like thinking so weird, like whatever's messing with people, it's us, it's, you know, it's messing with us. But then there is primitive camping that was kind of back. Like it was closer to us, but it was, you know, further back. And you would think like, is that guy also messing with primitive camping? Because that's kind of where he's coming from. Mm-hmm. Maybe he is a primitive camper and he's just, you know, I guess because where what was behind us was there was nothing. If you were back there, you're on a on a bike path 
or, uh, you know, you're walking or hiking or whatever. So there's no like camping back behind where we were because there's, it was kind of like swampy. So that's like the area that they were checking the, the helicopter. I always wonder too, like, because some people say that they can't swim, but some people say they can swim. I think they can swim. I don't know if they do, but if they can or they do, you would think maybe does it work with humans too? Like dive underwater kind of, because you know, if you're up to no good and you're doing all these things, you know, and you don't want to get caught and you know that they're going to send the chopper over, you know, how do you get rid of your body signature, your body heat signature? Yeah. Just jump in the water. Yeah. I mean, that's a lot to go through for just, you know, messing with people. That's what I mean. You're like whistling and grabbing some towels or whatever, you know, kind of mischievous stuff. But I don't know what else he was up to do, you know. I don't yeah. know what else he was up to, but yeah. it's just, it makes you wonder, like, was there really something and they just weren't telling us? I mean, that could be it too. Yeah. But yeah. But the big footing was me trying to get one to prove to the world. Hmm. <laughs> I didn't care. Like if something happened with like, you know, whatever, got to go to prison for it. And, you know, whatever, I'll go. I don't care. Not me. I'm not going to prison for Bigfoot. He's got enough of my life. Well, Sean, thank you so much for sharing your stories. Thanks for listening. If you like what we do here at Strange Familiars and you want to help us out, you could consider becoming a patron at Patreon. It's patreon.com slash strangefamiliars. All of our patrons get commercial-free versions of the weekly shows plus extra episodes. We do full extra episodes every month for our patrons, at least one, sometimes more than one. You can check out all the options at patreon.com slash strangefamiliars. There's also an option via Apple Podcasts. It's called Patron of the Strange there. If you sign up via Apple, you also get the weekly commercial free shows and the extra episodes as well. And as always, I'd like to thank all of our patrons, no matter where they support us. Thank you so much. We could not and would not do the show without you. Once again, it's patreon.com slash strangefamiliars. Where you been? Well, I have been living life in not the best way uh, the last few months. So. That makes it sound like you've uh, fallen into addiction or something. I have. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, I actually fell into uh, the hole outside your house. I mean, that's, that's, that's where I've been, along with all the furniture and, and things that Allison keeps in there. Th- that's the real uh, place where Octavian has moved. Yeah. When I say he's our neighbor, I really mean he just lives in the hole behind our house. <laughs> No, I've just been kind of... Uh, well, moving is huge. Like, moving yeah, is like... Yeah, so the last like probably more than six months, I've been working on this move to get up to Pennsylvania just because the last three years I've spent the majority of my free time up here hanging out with you and, and hiking on my own and exploring up here. And it was just time to get that change of scenery. So mm-hmm. I've now moved up, uh, become a permanent resident. Only about a three-minute drive from Tim's house, so I'll be a lot more active in these parts. So if you're hanging, you know, if you're at Alba Twitch Day, I'll certainly be there. I'll probably set up a tent. And Strange Dominions is coming back. As of this recording, there are two episodes that are coming out in the next two weeks, and we will resume our weekly shows. I will just put this out there because I know a lot of Strange Dominion listeners are Strange Familiars listeners and vice versa. If you have strange stories, especially pertaining to the occult, the esoteric, or anything like that that aren't necessarily Strange Familiars flavored, please consider coming on Strange Dominions to tell your stories. Uh, I'm definitely trying to push more Witness episodes this year and the you know ongoing of the show. So that's my piece. Right on. And also you're looking for fellow occultists who, I, I know the, the very nature of it is, is secretive. Right? Yes. But you've said you've... You'd love to talk to people about their actual practices. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. If you if you if you don't mind sharing it and kind of uh, highlighting certain areas that you don't mind other people hearing, I would love to talk to you. And I will just go ahead and say this: I am on the hunt for more co-hosts, um, either occasional or permanent. 
if you enjoy what we do and you feel that you have a voice to add to what we talk about and what we experiment with, please email me at strange dominions podcast at gmail.com and let's have a conversation. Yeah, a co host is so helpful. I've done it alone mm-hmm. and I've done it with co hosts. And it's so helpful to have a co it's so helpful to have someone to talk to. Mm-hmm. And I think the, the the guests appreciate that as well, as having multiple voices to kind of bounce your ideas off and keep that dead space as yeah. little as possible. Yeah, otherwise you're talking to a wall. Exactly. And I do my best to make it sound natural when I do it alone, but mm-hmm. some, it's hard. Sometimes. Yeah, it's really it hard. is. Yeah. So yeah, co-host is, is very, very helpful. That's good. People have been asking. Oh, well, where, I appreciate where that. Where Strange Dominions was. Thank you. I told them... You probably got kidnapped by a demon or yep, something. I got possessed. You and... know, and yeah, all that devilry. Mm-hmm. Right but no, I am coming back with a vengeance. Oh, with a vengeance. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing I wanted to talk about, hopefully I will have a Witch Diggers t-shirt design sometime soon. And the idea for that is to hopefully fund this trip out to Indiana. This t-shirt won't be done. But the design will be done maybe before I go out there. I don't know. It's going to be a busy month leading up to that. I'm going to try. I'd love to generate some some funds. I feel like I try not to ask too much for money, and I try not to ask for anything without giving something. You know, like if you want to support us, T-shirts, you know, go to the Etsy shop, this and that, you know, extra shows via Patreon. I try not to just come right out and ask for money, but this is going to be an expensive trip to Indiana. I got to rent a car. My car will not get us out there. It's not going to do it. I got to rent a car. We've got to pay for housing, food, et cetera, et cetera. So whenever I get that done, any proceeds from that T-shirt will will help with the Witch Diggers exploration and expedition. Yeah, exactly. And you and, you know, I should say we as listeners, we still, you know, profit off this in our own way because what you're talking about and what we've been hearing so far regarding the Witch Digger saga is nothing short of um, groundbreaking, really, because the things that you're talking about and, and what you have the possibility to uh, encounter and discover is something that we haven't really had a chance to experience or witness. I have, since doing this story, since finding that newspaper article and putting it out there, and I know a couple other podcasts covered it after us, but I'm pretty sure we were the first. Since finding that newspaper article, I always wanted to do something more. When the people in the area, and now it's been several, several people in the area started contacting me and telling me about these activities. When I got contacted by the folks, you know, living on the property there, and they told me these stories, my feeling, for whatever it's worth, is that this has been waiting. It's been waiting for me. This is a book. This is a Strange Familiars expedition. This is... Remember, this was the first story we did that wasn't based on my first book. Mm -hmm. The first three episodes were based on my first book. This was the first, you know, sort of wholly original Strange Familiars project. Interestingly enough, it was the first project I ever did with Josh Cutchin. There's so much about this that just, it just feels like... A lot of branches have, you know, gone out Mm -hmm. within the Strange Familiars verse that all center around this story. Yeah, and and it feels like this has been been waiting for me. This is the next big thing in the paranormal for me. I'm super excited about it. People have asked me about like the Ohio Siege episode. Am I going to pursue that? Yeah, I'm I'm going to. I know where it is. Mm -hmm. I've gotten more information on that. I was told by someone that one of the original investigators of the Ohio Siege is writing a book on it. I was planning on writing a book and then that kind of made me step back because, like, supposedly he had more information, as you would if you were one of the guys that was on the ground there. Any updates on that? Well, someone told me this guy was going to write a book, and then I haven't seen his book. It's been years. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen his book. The person I thought who told me that said they didn't think they were the one that told me that. Mm. So I don't know. I don't know where this person's book is. I would love to write a book on that. We do have plans to go there, just like we have plans, you know, just like Indiana. Mm -hmm. We have plans to go there, but Indiana takes precedence because it's a huge story. The Witch Diggers, that's Strange Familiars. That's very, that's Strange Mm -hmm. Familiars right there. The Witch Diggers and Strange Familiars. So 
you know, like I said, I don't want this whole episode to be about begging for money, but we are going to do a Witch Diggers t-shirt eventually. Until then, you can check out our Etsy shop. You can support us that way. Our shop name is Lost Grave. There's links in the show notes. There's Strange Familiars t-shirts there. There's mugs. There's copies of my books. I just got restocks of everything. So all books are in stock. My artwork, prints, and originals are there. I will be restocking the Bigfoot Big Heart prints and the Black Dog print sometime soon. Next week, maybe. Depends on how busy my printer is. He's the only person who does it on this special paper, and it, it takes a little while. It might be next week before there, it might be the week after that. We'll see. In any case, restocks on those prints are coming. I do have other prints in there, though. We got the Mothman print. We've got the Bigfoot with Orb print, the cover of Where the Footprints End 2. We've got uh, John Stink prints. Uh, there's the cover to Where the Footprints End 1. There's a, there's a bigger print. I've got paracord rosaries I make at Etsy. The Flowered Path t-shirts are back in stock. I keep forgetting to mention this actually on the Flowered Path, but for those of you who like both, we do have Flowered Path t-shirts back in stock finally. Uh, we got Flowered Path tote bags now. I haven't gotten them up there, but I'll get them in the shop soon. Allison has antique photos. All of that's up there at Etsy. Supporting us on Etsy supports the show, helps us out. If you can help us out with this trip to Indiana, it'll be huge for us and... I guess that's it. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for listening. Hope everybody's doing well out there. We'll be back soon with more Strange Familiars. Strange Familiars is a production of Dark Collar Arts. Intro and background music is by Stone Breath. If you want to hear more or purchase music, you can go to stonebreath.bandcamp.com. Strange Familiars is on Facebook, facebook.com slash strangefamiliars. We're on Instagram, at strangefamiliars, one word, no underscore. What's your Instagram? Strange Dominions Podcast. No underscore, no spaces? Nope. Same thing with the uh, the Facebook page. Um, we are on TikTok, although we don't really use it, but uh, I think that'll change now that I'm, I've got more time to dedicate to everything. All right. And for Strange Familiars merch, it's strangefamiliars.com slash merch. And then strangefamiliars.com is always open. Tears mark all the 